This episode of American Bandito is brought to you by the Lorenzo's music album, Cool Ships and Heat Exchangers, which is now available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere that you listen to music that is, streaming or otherwise. Or if you'd like to download the album, you can go to lorenzosmusic.com slash EP and get the album for free. And I like how I said it's brought to you by because it's my band. Basically, I'm just promoting myself. So enjoy. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. So here's something interesting I've noticed. First of all, let me mention something. Madison is a big town, but it's not really that big. I mean, it is, but comparatively, it's pretty small. The population is like 252,000, but it's still a pretty big place. What I find odd is I've walked around here and in the past 10 years, not really recognized as many people as I used to. But once I started this show, the people that I've interviewed over the course of a month, I've actually seen them out and about. I'll randomly run into them at places. Another thing my wife and I have been trying to do is go to more openings, more gallery shows. I'm there to support the arts, but when you go there, you're walking into a public place. You don't really meet anybody. But since I've started this, I'll go to those places and I will meet people. I'll go to galleries because I met people and they told me I should go. And it's kind of a nice little bonus of this whole thing. Now today, speaking of how big this city is and how small it is, the guy that I met today, he actually has a studio that is across the street from a place that I go practice with my band every week. I've been going there since 2005. We've literally been across the street from each other and I've never met him before. So how about that for a small city? So join me while I meet Philip Salamone. You're over right on Winnebago, right? You're at the building over there? He is, yeah. Right near Shanks Corners. Okay. I'm over there all the time. My guitar player runs DNA Studios right across the street. I've been going over there all the time, and I've always wondered what's in that studio over there. I see the, it says Winnebago Studios right out front. And I've seen parking in that parking lot right next to it. There was a guy that was doing, I want to say it looked like he was doing doing metal work. Yeah, he does that in the parking lot sometimes. He's uh He's great. Well, yeah. we painted a picture of him once. Did you? Yeah, when we had him model, <laughs> I was like, yo, Will, you should model with like your welding rubber overalls and your like goggles. And he's like, yeah. And I can like, he brought in an anvil, uh-huh. and, like a piece of red neon because he's got a neon studio in there. Set the neon on the anvil and then hung a hammer from the ceiling on a string and held the hammer up with his arm. Yeah. Was like kind of banging on this like Uh rod you know artists make great models they know what you need they know how to hold a pose they enthusiasm i think more than anything and knowing sort of the background and what's going to be done and what's expected of them probably because they've been on the other side of that situation in some way shape or form it's funny when i first talked to you right after you had contacted me back my wife and i went to fair trade coffee house and i was like wait a minute i looked up on the wall and your stuff's right up there it was like i recognized it right away yeah it's a good spot for it I, i got i lucked out I contacted them. Usually it's a year and a half wait, but it just took over new management and the management didn't have the artist's info or someone didn't contact them or yeah, you know, I threw it up. On Tuesday, we're putting work up in the Overture Center. Wanted to ask you about that too. When we first scheduled you, you couldn't do the day because you actually had a showing coming up and it's going to be on the, on the 13th. Yep. Putting it all up on Wednesday, Wednesday morning, back to back, you know, my solo show at Fair Trade and then across the street. My group that we paint together and we've been working on this for about almost two years, like getting people who have been incarcerated to come sit for us and just kind of hearing their stories and put them on a platform. And yeah, uh, this woman, Pat Dillon, runs a gallery and she is also or she used to run a gallery. She's more of a writer and she has a grandson whose father is incarcerated she had this idea for this show. I liked the idea, but I wanted to work from life. So she knew a lot of these people in the community, the kind of activist sort of prison reform movement. They started coming into our studio. And when that happened, it was like, all right, well, now I got a couple paintings for you. But I also have 
a dozen other people that also have paintings for you. I just, I think it's a different show also if you're, they're sitting in front of you than if it's from a photo. So that's how it got started. And we had the show in the, in the studio here in the gallery space in the, in the middle of the studio last April. And then we applied for the overture at around that time. And, you know, a year later, we've been doing a lot of that. I wanted to get a little background on you. Are you from Madison or are you from somewhere else? I was born here. My okay. parents are from Long Island, New York. Oh. They came out here for my father, went to grad school out here, did like a labor relations thing and ended up working on the plant in Janesville for a while after that. And so the first few years of my life, I was living kind of near Janesville. And then they got a job up near kind of central Wisconsin, like near Wausau, okay. like 20 miles east. I mean, that's more or less, I would say, where I'm from, nurture wise. but you know, I've always felt a little like a black sheep, kind of, you know, like we didn't have a snowmobile or ice fish or a cabin up north or yeah. hackers, you know, they're like <laughs> East Coast Italian, like it just wasn't, there was, I could tell that something was different, you know, and so I feel like I got a healthy dose of East Coast sort of, I don't know, union organizing, <laughs> <laughs> just my, my parents from out there and then my sort of friends from central Wisconsin and the sort of Northwoods lifestyle. And then I came to college in Madison and then I just didn't find what I was looking for. I thought I would, I guess, but I, I ended up going back to New York for, for three years to, to study kind of classical training. That, that wasn't cutting for you and you went to, to New York, you're saying? Right. Well, I didn't know that you don't learn this stuff in college. I, I kind of liked to draw and I could sort of copy a photo but I didn't, you know, when you sort of try to get to that next level, either painting or working from life or something, certainly working from life, mm -hmm. I, I just felt like I was, the, the path I was on did not lead to like the, the work I really admired. I got to a point where I knew that I didn't know yeah. what I mean. Uh -huh. And so, you know, university programs for the most part are kind of, they're not, they're, they're, their focus is not craft and technique and sense of space and volume. And it's, it's more about kind of just being different or finding your own voice, which I love. I, I just, I wanted to learn the language. I think that's important as well as, as what you want to say. So after, after college here, I researched to try to find like a grad school that maybe focused on the type of things that I was interested in and found that I couldn't even find that. If you wanted this type of stuff, you kind of just had to find like a master. It's like a lineage from like back in France or something. Uh -huh. And I found it and it was amazing and it was wonderful. And they taught me things that I would have never thought in a million years, no matter how many drawings I've done. Who did you find? Uh, this this uh, school is called the Grand Central Academy. Now it's called the Grand Central Atelier. And at the time, it was a collaborative effort between Jacob Collins, Michael Grimaldi, Dan Thompson, and Kate Lehman, four just unbelievable artists and just incredible teachers. And they ended up sort of disbanding. Three of the people went off and started their own school. But the Grand Central Atelier is still doing amazing out there. Yeah. And so I, I, I kind of wanted to, I guess, I came back to Madison to sort of share what I've learned and find people maybe who were like me who wanted this type of training, but didn't have access to it, which, you know, when I went out there, it was its, it was its first year of the GCA. I noticed that at the place you're at there, you actually do teach there. Yeah, I, I was just really inspired by these people that were able to articulate these kind of thought processes that I was doing kind of intuitively, but didn't really know that I was doing that or didn't have words for it. I, and I and I watched myself get better, and I was just like, mm -hmm. "Wow, this is like v very much like a ten thousand hours type thing." You know, it's not some sort of talent type of thing. And so I I just knew that there's people that have that that artistic impulse mm -hmm. that for for people my age and and a little bit older than me, it was really hard to find people who knew how to do that. The last century didn't really bode well for that type of thinking, that type of work, that type of mindset, et cetera. Plus, my, I got a big family. They're all here. I love <laughs> Madison. You know, I love New York and it was tough to leave. And I'm going to go back for a little bit, but it just, just felt right. 
How did you start out and then find really your voice leading up to you going to school to find people that could help you express it? I would say that you, I'm still finding it and you're still, you're always kind of looking. True. You know, yeah. but I, when I was younger, I was doing, you know, I like, like action figures. <laughs> then I was like, well, Michelangelo is way better than like <laughs> Stan Lee. <laughs> And I liked like a lot of the Fillmore type posters, you know, I think that you, you really sort of start out trying a bunch of different things. You know, I mean, I had to do printmaking courses. I, I think that I'm still kind of, I I try really hard to step outside of my comfort zone, you know, Mm -hmm. step outside of maybe what my voice might be and really try a lot of new approaches and new ways of working and, compositions and stuff but i think as time goes on that sort of deviation that range within your voice sort of narrows and i just always loved kind of i love working from the live model that Mm -hmm. always was really there's just this kind of magic that happens with the, the person right in front of you i think a lot of times sometimes you get jobs that maybe i got a pretty big mural commission and in trying to work out some of the problems with that, like compositionally, I I started getting into artists like Thomas Hart Benton and uh, Stanley Spencer, artists who you're trying to problem solve and you see these people and the way that they've done it. And that was maybe my my formative years or something because I still love Thomas Hart Benton. (laughs) You're also just inevitably influenced by, you go out to New York and they all love like, you know, the academic artists, Bastion Lepage and Bougaro and these people. And Mm -hmm. I like them. I don't really know how to answer that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know my, my aesthetics or whatever. I I think. I guess maybe I was looking for more like, what was the evolution when you started and you look back? Like, what would you say your style was as opposed to, I, I guess I was asking more of like a explain your existence, sort of the way that I put it. When we first started talking and you were saying you lived in like a small town, but you were from New York and you were kind of a black sheep in the in the neighborhood. It's interesting that when I look at your pictures, I recognize so many people from around Madison or from around the area or I see familiar faces in those paintings. And it's interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. that feeling like an outsider, the way that you express yourself is by taking very personal places in time of these people that are actually from around the town. That's Wausau, you know, like <laughs> right. that's that's a tiny town east of Wausau. I mean, Madison, I very feel very Madison-y. Yeah. And those portraits are, that's by design. It's a local type of thing, you know? It's I kind of think of the slow food movement a little bit, you know, where okay. it's like people are taking a step, not really a step back because it's kind of a revival, but saying like, I'm going to, focusing on local aspects, but also like I'm going to I'm going to spend more time and more money and I'm I'm more interested in these processes of creating food that my grandparents used even though it takes longer and even though you know we might have machines and processes in place to maybe do it more efficiently or quicker or something I believe that it's a different product that's being created with this work the way that we work and with the, that food the way that it's grown so it's sort of like a back to our roots sort of step away from the kind of homogenization type but but also like an embrace of like local culture local yeah. limitations also i love that that you can recognize people though that is part of what i want you yeah. know is people be like that's that's catfish you know i want to say madison also does have a very a very large number of doppelgangers there there's so many people in this town where like i'll be walking down and i'm like hey that's a person and it's like no that would be that person if they were 20 years younger it's the weirdest thing <laughs> i run into that all the time there's a painting you did of i think it's russ and you posted that it was actually one of your best friends that you did a painting of and he mm-hmm. reminds me of a guy mm-hmm. new named john Kerry, not the dude okay. that ran for president but again the picture here that i see of him it's like oh that's john Kerry. if it was 1990 that's the way he looked back then <laughs> That's cool. You said that if you uh, haven't experienced painting a good friend of yours, you should try it. What was that like for you? I mean, I that's got to be weird, you know, right? <laughs> that's 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 a great question. I love that question because it was it's like magical and just this. It's such an amazing. That's why I wanted to move to New York and learn that. You know, that's that's at its heart. That's why I'm doing this. Is just like I just want to be able to paint people that mean something to me. Yeah. From life, it was 
you know, I thought of like, I have another friend that we, we, we were in art school together and he ended up doing tattoos a, a year into his like apprenticeship. He's, he's pretty good. I got a tattoo from him and it was just a, such this magical experience of just like, you're an expert in this and I'm watching you be an expert, you mm-hmm. know, in your element and you're doing this artwork for me, which is a very, I mean, it was, we shared a dog. He put like a heart with a bone on <laughs> a bone through it. It was and oh, so the cool. subject matter as well, it was just, you've been doing this for a while and now pieces have kind of come together and you're, you know, we sort of kind of know what we're doing a little bit more. Mm-hmm. He is starting, a, Russ is starting a law firm and he wanted a kind of an official portrait. I owed him some money. We went to the Boundary Waters together. Awesome. Awesome time. Nice. That's the Northwoods. <laughs> <laughs> the Northwoods part of me. Uh-huh. And he's like, yeah, and I'll, I'll throw you some extra cash. And, and he showed up and he just like, he knew exactly what he wanted. He was dressed to the nines. He really wanted a nice portrait. So he sat super still. Our friend was with us and chatting the whole time. And it was when they really want a great portrait of themselves, they, you know, he sat for 45 minutes at a time instead of 20. It infuses itself into your process. You know, he really wants a good piece. So I'm going to, I'm going to really show up, you know? Yeah. I was already there, but I mean, he shows up dressed up and bringing that much seriousness to it, I guess, but in enth- and enthusiasm mm-hmm. and passion, like, all right, sweet, because that's, that's why I'm doing this. Not, not to, I could paint statues, you know, I mean, they're cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> Model fees are cheaper. <laughs> Late, it, the, these classes in general started as just, you know, you'd hire a, a nude model or something. And we still do that a lot, but over time it's become more people who mean something to me in some way, shape, or form, someone I want a picture of on my wall, someone I want to spend time looking at and recreating, mm-hmm. the guy who sells me coffee, <laughs> the coffee shop, the, you know, just people in my life that, and certainly people that I've grown up with that have kind of seen me through my different phases. It was just a really, it's hard to put words on that experience, but yeah, I don't know. It's like sometimes two people might play like a game of chess and it was just this really sort of poetic, maybe risky, really beautiful game. But if you don't know the game, you're just, it doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? And But the other people sort of understand that something special happened there. Yeah. That makes sense. It does make sense. I actually like the, uh, the example of saying it's like a game of chess because also it's just two people, like regardless of the outcome, you're there just to do something together. Very much so. I like it that. Is, I'm very much after the process. I think it's, it's, These paintings are, I think of them as a record of an experience. What is the medium that you use? Are you doing oils or acrylic and and what do you paint on? These are all the portraits you saw were oil and there's oil oil. on linen. If if you get a job, that's a mural. That's that's acrylic. Have you done Um, some murals? Yep. Uh, There's one at Epic. There's a massive one at Epic. Really? It's like, yeah, it's like 16 feet tall and then the perimeter of a football field. (laughs) Wow. It took like me and three other artists seven months to do that. Okay. It's pretty wild. It's on my website. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to look for it right now because I don't think I saw that. Right. I did some backdrops for American Girl, the, the doll company. I gotcha. Okay. I see Epic. what you're talking about now. Okay. And then uh, Union South, before they tore it down, I did, that was the one that was very Benton inspired, Thomas Hart Benton. That's crazy. So, okay. How did you uh, line that up? So that's another thing I like to talk about too is... When people are trying to do things, like how do they find themselves work? So how did you land something like doing murals at Epic? (laughs) You just begin by just beginning. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sort of. You're just like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to start a portfolio. And, you know, I I did that that Union South mural in in 2003 or something. Okay. And so I had some experience doing larger things. That helps you get jobs. People can see that you've done similar stuff. Yeah. Um, but I had a I had a student I'm I'm teaching at for continuing studies at the university. Oh, cool. One of my students worked at worked at Epic and she got she got that job and she needed help and so she asked me. Was how I got that one. But how does anyone get it with with any of those? The American Girl or Children's Theater or there's other garage door weird stuff. I don't really say no as often as I just try to find a way to to make it work, if it can work financially, then I, I sort of interpret all of these projects, even if I'm not that inspired by them, again, as a study. And mm-hmm. it's, it is a job. 
And I'm going to try to find a way to be really passionate about this, even, even though it's not maybe my wheelhouse or my strength or what I necessarily want to be doing. You know, I, I told myself a long time ago that I'm, I want to make artwork and making, mm-hmm. doing commissions like this, I think are a great way to just force yourself out of your comfort zone and, and learn, so learn new things and get paid for it. I mean, Epic, that was house paint. <laughs> you know, <laughs> was it, really? you do a, it took a while to get used to painting in house paint, like theater painters, and they paint really weird. They don't use a palette. They put it right on the wall, and yeah. then they, they kind of blend it on the wall. But you, you figure out how to make it work, and then that informs your actual work. You're like, oh, what if I did this with oil? Uh, what if I only had 30 seconds and it was dry on yeah. the paper, on the, on the canvas? Then... You know, I would show up at night then during those sessions in oil and make very clear, deliberate decisions rather than, oh, I'll fix it later. It's oil. It's going to be wet all night. You know, I can always adjust that later. Uh Well, all day, you know, for the last seven months at Epic, it's latex paint. And so it it dries in 30 seconds. And so you got to, you can learn things that sort of apply to your, your other medium. I've been doing watercolor lately. And again, it's like, Huh, I should take my own advice and use this for oil paints. Huh? If that makes sense. I like no. That's that's actually brilliant. Instead of just going, God, I hate using this stuff. You're just like, oh, what can right. I do with this? Yeah. I mean, it's a job. Yeah. It's a job. Who cares if you huh. hate it? This is like, I mean, there are parts of every job that you don't like, you know. But let's yeah, let's take something from it and learn something from it. And and I have to remind myself that more and more. <laughs> <laughs> You said you're doing a continuing studies class. How'd you get started with that? Well, after New York, I was I was just driving cab for a while at Union Cab, and I got a job with them maybe four and a half years ago, and it's been really great. That was where I really learned how to teach. How so? Well, you know, you leave New York, and then you're it's just a different environment you're surrounded by people your age that have your sort of knowledge and skill level or something and Uh and they're and you're working on a pose that lasts all month 80 hours on this pose and then you're you know in a room in a retirement home yeah (laughs) you know with people who are kind of beginners it's a lot like like making a painting where you have to kind of simplify and like extract the important information and just just really put walking in their footsteps. It took a long time for me to understand where, where people were coming from and what to emphasize and what to downplay. And you're still, you're still learning that of course, but it's a slower learning curve or at this point, I'm not learning as much as I was the first few years of teaching and just how to, you know, when I started teaching, I, I just didn't feel like I would be a good teacher. I, I didn't feel like I knew enough. I still, there's so much to know. But I was like, you know, I think I know more than them. <laughs> I bet I could give them their money's worth. Uh, and I'm going to try my hardest. And that's the most I can do. And it's it's been great. Right now, I'm, I only do a beginning, beginning drawing class with them. And then the more advanced stuff is mostly at my studio, the oils and stuff. The open studio over there is amazing. The lighting's great. The people are great. My, my, my goal is to kind of, you know, I want to be the best that I can be. And so I feel like this sort of teaching endeavor, community building is all kind of part of that greater goal that like, I'm, I'm sort of in it for myself teaching. I've been the greatest beneficiary of any of that, Mm -hmm. you know, by all means. I mean, you study for a lesson and people ask you questions and you, you end up articulating and analyzing all of these things of why you're saying them. So, so in that way, teaching gets you better, but also just having this greater community, I feel like is just really important just to have so many other minds that have similar goals that we're all getting together frequently. And we're talking about, you know, what website you saw or material you just discovered or Mm -hmm. thing that you just learned about. And it's like, that sort of, you know, rising tide type of thing. So the the continuing studies is sort of like, hey, I'm looking for some fellow travelers out here, guys. And the the continuing studies is is really a community oriented 
thing. You know, you don't need to be degree seeking to, to sign up for that. And it's been great. There's been a lot of crossover between here and there. The interesting thing is, as you said, you don't feel like you know enough or, or know everything to be a teacher, but that's also exactly why you uh, went to go find more of a master when you were going to college because, you know, they were just showing you things and you were like, right. I'm not learning what I need to be learning. And the way you're talking about teaching is like, you're also learning as a teacher. You're not just saying like, okay, I know what to do here, do this. Very much so. You know, you're Very working with so. them and going, what do they want to know? Where where are they at? And also with, with continuing studies, I mean, that's really where it is, is. It's people like going, I want to do this again, or I want to learn more at this stage in my life. How do you find the time to do all this and actually maintain your well-being? Well, I don't know if my being is well-maintained, <laughs> but but I, I prioritize the time and the money. You know, I, I just like, this is important to me, so I'll sacrifice things that, that, you know, I don't have a car or something. You don't really need one in mm -hmm. this town where I live and stuff. I, I just position my life in such a way so that I can maximize my time to be able to do this, which means like driving at Union Cab really helps because like you can take a long break if you want. You can not work if you don't want. I'm an owner, right? I mean, you can you can work if you need money. You can not work if you got other jobs going on. And so I, I wanted something that was very flexible that I could, you know, that I didn't take home with me. I think we all have the same amount of time. I have the same amount of time as Tiepolo. <laughs> it's important to me. You know, there are periods when I didn't paint and, and it was it was weird. I didn't mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't me. You know, it's like a people who work out all the time or something, and then they they can't for whatever reason. You know, you're just you're out of sync with your natural just the thing that that I love to do. Everyone has their things. In doing that, like if you stop, it almost has a reverse effect in the sense that you start to feel resentment for people that are still doing it. Normally, you'd be like, "Wow, that's really awesome." and what you're really doing oh, that's is a good point. You know, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. You can't even like appreciate that. I thought of once, you know, once I'm like wake up, we're like we're doing this landscape thing, and I like wake up at like super early, go out to Tenney Park, and I see these like fishermen out there before me, and I'm just like, what the heck are these guys doing yeah. out there? Fishing to me is just like I have no patience for anything really, especially sitting around with a fishing pole. I'm like, you know, they. They sell that stuff at the stores. You could like buy fish, you know. Uh -huh. And so, but then I'm like, wait a minute. I'm doing the same thing as those guys. I'm standing here with an easel and a paintbrush. I feel like one of those guys in like the, the Renaissance fair, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm, I'm just as like anachronistic in a, in a sense. Like it's, it's just as irrational, but it makes perfect sense if you look at it through the lens of like, you know, dogs want to chew bones. Cats want to chase mice. I, I, I love doing this. Like these guys love doing that. I don't get it. And we, we make time for it and we position our lives and kind of make sacrifices like getting up super early to, to go do these things that mean something to us. But yeah, I don't, I don't have a reason why other than trying to come up with an analogy that might apply to the person I'm talking to. <laughs> Same sort of thing. Like they see you painting, like say you're doing a landscape, somebody walks by and holds up their phone and takes a picture and goes, there, I just saved you an entire day. Hippie, get a job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah. exactly it. It's like, if that's your passion, of course, other people aren't going to understand it, but there are people who do, which is why there is artwork everywhere or there is fish to eat. It, and also the pride in the people that do fish. Like they go, oh my God, look at this huge fish that I caught today. I mean, that, there's something to be said about like going, look at this big old fish here that yeah. I caught. Chasing that, you know, like just that, that, that feeling of that, that bobber going under, uh -huh. you know what I mean? That's like, that's like the crack cocaine of fishing. Right. And I feel like we, we have that in painting, you know, that, that brush stroke or that moment or holding up that painting at the end or just like surprising yourself in these little, these little ways. If we didn't have that, there are so many reasons to not do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, really easy you know, not money to. and everything. Yeah. It's really discouraging and demoralizing, like even on a craft in a sense of craft, but then you get into like devoting your life and finding your voice and making money and sacrifices and stuff. And yeah that it's that that bobber going under that's like all right i'll stick with it how do you promote yourself otherwise uh, outside of like networking and knowing people and doing the class i mean do you do any promotion for your stuff i mean you've got your website but do you flyer do any online promotion or anything like that or sell things online oh man i'm, I'm so bad at that are now. you <laughs> 
I'm the worst at promoting. Yeah, I'm the worst at any online stuff. I hate it all. Huh. But it's a job, so whatever. I don't I don't mind it because it is my job. It allows me to do this, but it's not my strength for sure. I think the best marketing is to market to people who've already bought your product in the sense mm. that if I can be the best teacher I can be, and if I can make the best paintings I can, then those people, my hope is that they'll take another class okay. or tell their friends or something. I, I mean, I know that I'm what I'm offering, even among artists, even if I were maybe a teacher at the university or something, it's still a very small sample size of people that are interested in working from life and really kind of the what I have to offer, what my strength is. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't just throw flyers up in kiosks on State Street, um, but I do have some flyers at the art store, and those guys are great. They we we work together; they're they're awesome. The main one right off of State Street, right? I like that place. Yeah, they're they're cool. I like them a lot. Yeah. Um, but but having work at Fair Trade and that that type of stuff helps for the most part. I'm not really selling stuff online or selling stuff at those shows because they're mostly portraits. Yeah, I, I made a little bit of money making them just with the sessions I, I run and stuff but they mostly serve to attract people to me for people who either want to learn or maybe they have their own way of working and they just want that kind of gym membership you know they just want to tend mm. to their garden and show up and work from the model and like yeah maybe want a community they want a routine i try to give as great a atmosphere as i can just as far as models and food and music and stuff and as far as advertising, I don't really, I think it's important to kind of like lecturing myself here, just have an updated <laughs> website and stuff though, you know? Well, sort you do of, have like, because like you have 34,000 Instagram followers. I mean, there's something to be said about that. 3,400, but I, oh, sorry, 3,400. I, should, I, should, I shouldn't have corrected you because that would be badass. <laughs> yeah, that would be, I meant 3,400. You know, and, and there's um, something to be said about that. That's not me advertising. That's just me putting work up on Instagram and then people finding it True. somehow. I, I'm not sure how that happens, but Instagram might have some algorithm or whatever that puts it in front of people's faces who might be interested. Yeah. I'm not really sure. Hashtags works, always really help for some reason. I really, the mystery of hashtags on Instagram is very strange. It's, I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't know. There's some sort of like uh, Instagram, Facebook, they know what people like. They know what people are looking at. And I think they want people to use their product, you know, and they see me producing content for them. Yeah. And so they'll put that content in front of other people who are looking at it, I think. Yeah, if and you got networking. ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's how I, uh, for this podcast, is I wanted to find people in Madison. So that's what I did is I did a call out for artists on Facebook in the Madison area. Also with, uh, I put an interest in podcasting so people would understand that I was doing a podcast. And that's that's how I found a lot of the people I'm talking to. It was really just a small call out like that. And I filled up my whole calendar yeah. for July with it, just doing that. So it's been an interesting experiment. Also, one last question that I always like to ask because I find out so much more interesting stuff. Is there anything that you'd like to mention that maybe we didn't cover today, like projects you have coming up or something that really has nothing to do with the subject that we talked about that you'd like to mention? It'd be great if, you know, right now, check out my show, I guess, is mm -hmm. at Fairtrade till the end of August. And at uh, we have a pretty big group show at the Overture across the street till the end of August. Yeah. I think the main thing I wanted... For, for me, I just, I wanted to just, I spent a lot of time kind of going down this path without any idea of like where it ended up. And like, there's so many voices, especially out here in the Midwest of just like do something practical or just especially voices you're, you're telling yourself and other people are telling you in some not so subtle ways. I felt like it was important for, for me to just like, but you don't, you don't fish. <laughs> you don't know what that's like, you know? So like, you don't really get a vote. Appreciate your counsel, but like, it's not really a democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think just, you know, I still kind of question a lot of the parts of my path, but I think it's important to kind of, I don't know, just be the change you, you want to see. You, even if you're a Sunday painter, you know, I think it's important to sort of heed that call and paint on Sundays. 
I like to run. You know, I don't do marathons, but I'll run 20 minutes once a week or twice a week or something. And, and that's important to me. And I think if it's important to you to do this, you should do it. You don't have to devote your life, but you should just listen to that voice and like just scratch that itch for what it's worth. I mean, it's it just it keeps me sane. Well, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's, it's relative. I love that quote, though. Even if you run on Sundays, you don't, I mean, you don't have to run a marathon. You just do it because you like it. There's, you don't have to be That's that. That's the goal. Yeah, right. No one here is judging. You're in it for yourself. You go to the gym, like, it's the same thing. No one's looking at you. And, you know, if you're getting something out of it, then that's... Yeah, you're not trying to be about. Mr. Universe, you know. <laughs> or maybe you right. are, but, unless, you know, that's, unless unless that's, that's what cool. you're trying to do. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> This episode is coming out the last week of August. So if you do get the chance, go see Philip's artwork before the month runs out at Fairtrade Coffee House on State Street and at the Overture Center, where his work is included in the Faces of Incarceration exhibit. And again, I want to thank Philip for taking the chance to talk with me. Links to Philip's site and for his classes and his studio are at our website, AmericanBandito.com. So you can go there and check it out in the show notes. And on the website, don't forget to read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened, or you can also search for it on tapas.io. It's a web comic site. Just search for Then This Happened. Music for the show is provided by Romcom. That's com with two M's at romcomtheband.com. Thank you for listening, and you should subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or YouTube. I have another person to meet next week. Until then, so long.